Since my last video, a lot has transpired in that time. We firstly found the last Jedi. Luke! I got your coffee! Uh, someone looking for you? No, seriously? Well, three's the crowd. I leave you two alone. I discovered Netflix and came across a lot of stranger things. You alright? I got you a drink. You keep doing that, I'm not gonna give you another one. Elon decides to give a hardcore smackdown. <laughs> The point of doing this is to just give a hardcore smackdown to gasoline cars. And he finally launched a big flipping rocket. And talking about big flipping things, I finally finished my BFC. Now, I just want to be clear here, this was a project squarely based on any free time I had and there were many things that needed redesigning and testing before getting to this stage. So let's dive into this thing in more detail and have a look at the design hurdles I had to overcome as well as the new features I've implemented. Mr. Dre. By this stage I had already spent an unreasonable amount of time on CAD to get the design right but even so I still wanted to bring more useful features in this project prior to laser cutting anything. So I decided to add a removable panel that held a few helpful gauges. Things like a nifty little electrical parameter gauge with a super sexy OLED display. Now this didn't really provide any real practical information, but for my peace of mind, it's nice to know what amps are coming in, the supply voltage for the array of TP4056s, the temperature of the load wire from the power supply unit, the time it took between charging sessions, and the amount of power used or being consumed in amp hours and watt hours. I suppose that's the nerd in me. I also took inspiration from Paul Kennett's simple battery tester, so this was a handy tool in the event a TP4056 was not engaging, then I could quickly check here if the voltage was too low or too high. And another temperature gauge to monitor the return flow pipe of the cooling liquid, just so I know that the temperature is at a safe level. So once these changes were made, it was a simple case of getting all the components made and start the sub assemblies. Let's cue the first of many build montages.
Now that the parts have been made, it's time to assemble these into the machine. The BFC may look daunting due to its complexity, but there really is nothing to it. Like anything complicated, when you break it down, you'll realize it's just a multitude of sub-assemblies and the BFC is no different during its build. The 18650 sub-assembly holder will be the first things to put together. And when assembling 66 battery holders with their counterparts, this quickly becomes an exercise of repetition. For those of you already building power walls or salvaging 18650s, then repetition is something you should be very used to by now. So it's always a good idea to keep organized and plan ahead. As with 66 holders, I'll need 264 lengths of wires, whereby there will be 4,224 individual soldering spots to deal with. And that's just dealing with the 18650 holders, connecting them to the TP4056 with final connection to the bus bars. Here you can see that I even built a jig that could hold up to 20 wires so that pre-soldering them was an easier task. And you'll see later that other jigs were made to help with putting this machine together easier. Once all the wires were pre-soldered, the next step was to pre-tin the connectors on the holders themselves in readiness for the final connection. There's now the 128 small wood screws I used to fit the 18650 pre-wide holders to a laser cut acrylic holder bracket that was laser cut earlier. The wood screws do a fairly good job and is the best option for fixing the two parts together as this assembly will get a lot of punishment from swapping out cells. Moving swiftly on it was a case of rinse and repeat and this time we were pre-wiring the TP4056 modules. So to work out the correct lengths of the wires I simply dry fitted one module to determine the wiring length for them to be soldered to the bus. And once happy with the lengths I then marked cutting distances on some blue tape on my bench from which I was able to quickly and accurately cut all the wires needed. I have to say that a piece of blue tech as it's known in the UK was very helpful to quickly hold the modules at any comfortable angle for me to solder the wires on. So if you're brave enough to try this build or simply need to solder wires on many modules, then this is an awesome top tip. We can finally start the assembly and I would suggest installing the TP4056 modules first to the top disc and feed the wires through the holes. Now the module seemed to be retained fairly well, but I thought a spot of hot glue between the modules and the top disc wouldn't hurt. I kept the glue away from the actual chip itself as this can get fairly warm and may loosen the modules during its use. The project now really starts to take shape as I start to insert the cell holder assemblies onto the top disc and route the wires from the holders through the holes and into the output soldering points of the TP4056 modules. Each wire was bent back to help retain them and these were then soldered in place and finally trimmed back to give a clean finish. Next the bus bar rings. I'm using a scrap length of solid core heavy gauge wire left over from a job and destined for landfill. From my earlier calculations in the design phase I found that the cross sectional area needed to carry the load is 3mm squared for the ground wire and 5mm squared for the supply side. Stripping back the sheath the wire diameter measured 1.3mm so 3 cores for the ground and 4 cores for the supply is more than enough. And I'm sure you've all seen this before from other Maker channels, use a drill to twist and straighten the wires together, which really works a treat. I took the liberty of creating yet another template by using a strip of card and poking three holes. One hole as the center point and the other two holes for the two radiuses needed for the three core and the four core bus wires. These buses need to be made fairly accurately as they need to route through each of the bus retainer brackets as well as being soldered to each of the pre-cut pre-soldered wires coming from the input of the TP4056 modules.
I then, with the aid of some helping hands, flux and a very hot soldering iron, I soldered the ends together to give a nice twisted copper wire ring. In the future, I would recommend a crimped ferrule and back this up with more solder, as later I found that soldered joints can easily break over time. Right, on to the single most ball achingly difficult part of this build, which was the water cooled 8mm copper tube heat sink component. My initial plan was to just use a small pipe bender and turn the ends down to give us the return and flow connections within the unit. Now in my mind this looked to be an easy method but it proved to be more difficult in practice. Of course again to aid me I laser cut a nice clean circular jig to not only give me the most perfect circle but also ensure that when bending the pipe it was going to stay true and level. This part is the most critical component on this build as it has to maintain a level thermal contact with every single TP4056 chipset during its operation and disperse the heat to the radiator. Not making a thermal contact meant that the module could easily overheat and be prone to a shorter life. Now you can clearly see here the rookie mistake an amateur pipe fiddler like myself has made and I know that those of you who know how to deal with copper pipes are probably running for the hills screaming with fear. But just hold on a sec there as there is a better solution I came up with and that was to use 8mm elbow fittings to create the bends. This was far far simpler and quicker than hammering it into shape and of course a lot smoother bends so as to not restrict any flow of the coolant around the system. These 8mm elbow fittings were so useful that they saved the day later on during the build. So stay tuned. You can see clearly the difference between version 1 and version 2 and I hope I have redeemed myself from those of you who are so critical. The main thing here is we're learning from our mistakes. There is a small gap we need to address which is the space between the two flow and return pipes as there is one or two modules that need to be in contact with the heat tube. My solution was to cut a small sliver of copper and solder these to close the gap but I found this to be very fiddly and a challenging task and so in the end just opted for a small length of nickel strip and soldered this to close the gap. That should have given us enough thermal contact to transfer the heat to the heat pipe. After this I gave the pipe a good rub down using some scotch pipe and now needed to address the issue of a potential short circuit when this pipe is installed due to the copper's excellent electrical conductivity. For me clearly the best solution was to use 10mm Kapton tape as it too has good electrical resistance, excellent thermal conductivity and is a general durable hard wearing and adheres well to most substrates including copper. Unfortunately the tape itself is not very stretchy so I had to cut lots of 6cm lengths and tape this round. Now if you're lucky like me then maybe you have the M1000 electronic tape dispenser which handily deploys preset lengths of tape at a touch of a button very handy. I know, I know, I do make the simplest task a dramatic one, but if you could, wouldn't you? You can see why the part is so critical to be made up accurately, as not only does it need to be a millimeter perfect circle, but it also has to have a level flat curve so that it has the best possible point of surface contact with all of the TP4056 chips around the BFC. To further improve every chance of this thermal contact, I also employed the use of some thermal paste, 
which not only made up any high variation over the pipe but also increased the area of contact over the entire chip and an equal or greater area on the thermal pipe itself. Before you ask, this paste has no electrical conductivity, so it's safe to use liberally. Finally, the 3D printed clamps help retain and provide a downward force on the pipe to further maintain that point of thermal contact. And so the last item in store for the top disc is to fit the instrumentation panel and that pretty much concludes the top disc assembly. And we can now move on to the bottom disc, wiring of the gauges and the mammoth task of welding the 5 volt supply connections to the TP4056 modules onto the bus bars before we can then marry the top and bottom main sub assemblies together. Thank you very much for joining me on this build and please do come back to see part 2 which will include major hurdles I had to overcome, as well as the full reveal and operation of the big flipping charger. And there is to be a follow up project that slots in nicely with the 18650 recovery operation that I'm muddling through. I hope some lessons were learnt today, share the knowledge and let's get together for a better tomorrow.